you would learn more if you take a step back and say, look, actually, I need help. And, you know, I sat with individuals that had failed the board exam before, and I said, guys, how do you do it? How do you pick yourself up? And how do I get myself through this thing? Hi, thank you for joining me today and welcome to the Lead UP podcast. If you're wondering, my name is Lennox Wasara and I'm proud to be the host of this podcast because it is here that we manage to speak to some of the alumni from the University of Pretoria. And the University of Pretoria is also one of the biggest producers of research in South Africa, uh, let alone talking about its business school known as the Gordon Institute of Business Sciences, which famously known as Gibbs, has also recently earned a globally renowned Triple Crown status, which means it's been accredited by the EQUIS. That's certainly a profound uh, accreditation for the university. But interestingly, because today's guest is Deepa Sita, and she has been uh, at Gibbs before as a student, but also as a member of staff, she's been there as a CFO. So it'll be interesting to hear her views and her thoughts on life and her experience at the University of Pretoria. Fascinating is that Deepa Sita is a qualified chartered accountant and also has received an MBA in cum laude from the Gordon Institute of Business Sciences, a journey that began as a trainee accountant back at Deloitte back in the day. And thereafter, she moved to Samsung Electronics as a senior financial manager, and her career certainly took off. Currently, she is at the helm of the financial positions at Tiger Brands. She's the chief financial officer at Tiger Brands, which is arguably one of the largest producers of food in South Africa. Well, you can have a listen to my fascinating conversation with Deepa Sita. She shares from the heart as she shares her personal experience, but also reflects on some really lifelong lessons that she's accumulated over the years. Thank you for joining us today on another edition of the Lead UP podcast. And as you know by now, we continue to talk to trailblazers who have been through the University of Pretoria's uh, system and have done so well on the other side of the world. And they continue to make waves today. I'm joined by Deepa Sita. It's great to see you today. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Lennox. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. I'm not too sure about the trailblazing part, but uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> well, according to my research, I uh, give you that uh, a trailblazer. Um, taking it back to where it all started, growing up for you, you really got exposed to your family business, and at the time it was called Cita's Appliances. That must have been quite a thrilling experience for you. How, how, what was it like for you? Absolutely. Um, I think actually it certainly set the foundation of, of what I've achieved today. Um, you know, when, when you're growing up, um, you know, while all your mates are out having a good time, um, and you're running um, a family business with, with your folks, um, at that point in time, you know, tough. You'd like to much rather be out there enjoying your enjoying your time with mates. But in hindsight, I'm certainly very appreciative of of the the learning opportunities that I got at that point in time. Um, not many people can say, you know, at the age of ten, um, you know, acting as a salesperson, selling appliances, selling TVs, tuning TVs. Um, not many people can say that they started their career so early, but uh, certainly I think was the first milestone in, in my career and, and definitely set me up for success going forward. Yeah, I mean, you say you started at the age of 10. Uh, did you know what you were getting into at the time or you were just like, hey, I'm just helping out here? No, absolutely. Um, no, I definitely didn't realize that that was not a normal family life, to be honest. Um, you know, my folks were were selling appliances from from home. So, you know, I'd come home from school and there'd be customers in, in, in my house. Um, there'd be vendors in my house. Um, and for me, I thought that was normal. I thought engaging with, with the customers and supplies was, was a normal thing. Um, but it's only after, you know, after I got to university and, and got my first job, um, doing my articles, I realized the benefit um, of how that really molded me in, in terms of my confidence level, um, as well as just my ability to engage really commercially. Um, you know, so, so very appreciative of that. Um, but, but definitely didn't realize at the time that that was a normal life. <laughs> yeah. You know, one gets a sense you're light years ahead of your peers at the time. I mean, you probably had uh, by the time you matriculated, you had years of experience on end. <laughs> um, yeah, look, you know, it, um, it 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 certainly was was entertaining. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, being invited to to dinners, uh, joining my dad um, at supplier dinners and things, and and you know, sitting around a, a dinner table talking about business, talking about pricing and rebates and negotiations, etc. Um, you know, I, it it certainly did set me up for for what I do today. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, look, and, and also, you know, it was quite interesting because a lot of the business was done telephonically. So customers would phone in, place orders, and, and we would deliver. Um, so you could almost say that, that we were ahead of the time when you consider online shopping right now, albeit at that point in time via telephones. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's amazing how the world definitely turns. Yeah, it did turn uh, quite a lot. And one of the things I've noticed as well is that some of my friends have been playing sports since the age of four. And at some point, they kind of burn out because they're like, yo, I've been doing this for such a long time. I mean, you started really getting into business at 10. Did you not feel as though at some point you're like, okay, I'm a little bit burning, burnt out, want to do something else? Well, you know, it's, it's actually funny because um, I finished matric and the original plan was I wanted to do law. So, um, you know, did all the applications, uh, wanted to study law and, and then... You know, um, as is customary in, in Indian communities, you know, my folks sat me down and said, look, you know, we hear you want to do law, but um, what we think you should be doing is go and study finance, um, get your degree in, in accounting, because, you know, it'll be quite beneficial from a family business point of view. And after that, if you want to do law, no problem, we'll allow you to go back to university. Um, and, and it was amazing because, you know, my initial expectation of, of you know, studying towards becoming a charter accountant, I thought it was going to be all debits and credits. Um, but, but, you know, when I started at university, I realized that, that, you know, being a charter accountant wasn't about debits and credits, but it was actually about business. Um, you know, I, I, I majored in, in accounting as well as auditing and, and I just loved it, um, and, and never looked back. So, so needless to say, law never happened thereafter, but, um, you know, it, it was about using that entrepreneurial spirit that I grew up with, um, taking those learnings. Um, and really molding it together with the university learnings then um, and, and, and bringing the two together thereafter in, you know, my time at Deloitte and, and, and multiple corporate roles after that. So, you know, what I can say to you, charter accountancy is not only about debits and credits. I mean, obviously, you've got to know that stuff, but, um, but, but it's about making good business decisions and good commercial decisions. Yeah. Uh, making good business decisions, you know, you got that training back at Deloitte doing your articles at the time, but also at the time you were under some difficult circumstances whilst you're also getting your first year of articles, you took over the business. How was that process like for you at the time? Yeah, look, it, it, it was um, unfortunate circumstances. You know, my first year of articles, um, we, we were in a motor car accident and, and my dad actually passed away in, in, in the accident. Um, so, you know, you could almost say that um, overnight my life changed, um, you know, running a, one of the biggest appliance businesses in the country um, and, and, and still trying to, to, you know, do my articles and qualify as a charter accountant. But with that being said, um, you know, I couldn't have done it without the support of both family members as well as my colleagues at, at Deloitte. Um, you know, they were just amazing. Um, sat me down and said, look, you know, we, we understand the circumstances. How do we work together with you in order to, to ensure that you're able to qualify as a charter accountant? We give you the training you need, but we also allow you the flexibility to do what you need to do on, on, on the family side. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, as I said to you earlier on um, having dinners with vendors, et cetera, at a very young age, that all certainly came into play when all of a sudden, you know, you're not the owner of this business having to engage with these suppliers, et cetera. But it certainly helped knowing that, you know, I'd, I'd engaged with them informally before um, listening to all these discussions on pricing, rebates, et cetera. So, um, yeah, brought it together. But, but, you know, I must be honest, it would have been impossible without the support of, of family um, as well as my colleagues at, at Deloitte, which, you know, they would never let me give up. Um, you know, trust me, there were days when, when, when you're ready to give up, um, you know, I had to write my board exam at the time, um, passed the first board exam, no problem. The second one didn't pass it first time round. Um, and, and, you know, I was like ready to, to give up. I just thought, uh, you know, this is not for me. I'm done. And, and, you know, my, my, my mentors at, at Deloitte were just like, we're not interested in what you've got to say. We're going to work with you and we're going to make sure that you get through this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and if you ask me, you know, what's, what's been the best part of my career, um, it's failing the board exam. Really? Yeah. That would be odd, but why would that be? Yeah. Look, you know, it's, um, it's amazing up until that point in time, you know, I'd been successful and, and, you know, let's call it the best at everything. Mm. Um, you know, getting those distinctions, um, you know, being the prefect at school, et cetera, you know, things were always going according to plan. 
and then all of a sudden you hit with this big failure, um, you know, and, and particularly, you know, the, the second part of the board exam when I failed it, um, you know, at that time I was actually one of the highest rated auditing clerks at Deloitte's and I failed an auditing board exam. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it certainly brings you down a few notches. Um, but, but at that point in time, I realized that, that failure is not an option, but it actually is a learning opportunity. Um, and, and also, you know, you, you would learn more if you take a step back and say, look, actually I need help. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I sat with individuals that had failed the board exam before and I said, guys, how do you do it? How do you pick yourself up? Um, and, and how do I get myself through this thing? Um, and definitely, you know, it was the absolute best thing that could have happened to me because since then, um, I believe that, that failure is, is, is an opportunity to learn. It's a opportunity to rebuild yourself. And, and also, you know, it, like I said, you, you realize that you, you're not, you know, you're not indisposable at the end of the day. Um, yeah. you know, you can also, you also have flaws. It's what you do with those flaws at the end of the day. Uh, and I must tell you, eh, um, I'm, 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 you know, in, in, in a senior position right now, I've recruited a number of individuals. When somebody says to me, they've studied part-time and, and worked and still passed the exams, that's the one thing that appeals to me. And the other thing is when individuals tell me they failed exams, went back, redid it and passed. I think those individuals are super resilient and, and those, those, those candidates actually appeal to me at the end of the day. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean... Uh, thinking about my fair share of failures as well, and I think moments where I want to let go of my grip on where I want to go to, uh, but with you, you somewhat like tighten the grip on where you want to go, tighten the grip onto your goals, onto your plans, onto your vision. So what was it? Like, was it just really the support structure you mentioned that helped you to tighten your grip or uh, what made you not let go in those moments? Yeah, look, I think it's a it's a pride thing, eh? Um, it's Look, so definitely... The support structure, you know, slap you into shape and go, hey, um, you, you can do this. Um, but then also it becomes a self-pride thing. Um, you know, I'm going to prove this to myself. I can do this. Um, and and I'm, I'm not just going to do it. I'm going to do it well. Um, you know, that's the other element as well. So, yep, doesn't matter. I've I failed, but but I'm going to redo this and, and I'm certainly going to stand the test of time. You know, the other thing my, my, my dad always used to tell me, Hey, it, it, you know, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation. It yeah. takes a split second to break a reputation. And that's just something I live my life by. So for me, it's like, yeah, I can, I can have a reputation, you know, that I've, I've spent so long building and in a split second, just break it by saying, I'm done. I give up as opposed to keep going, be better at it, um, and deliver the goods, eh? Yeah. I guess, you know, a sense of desperation, adversity brings in a sense of, you know, excellence, so to speak. Um, listening to you now, I can hear that sort of fostered a great level of excellence into your work, as you said, like wanting to do it with the more intensity, more rigor. Um, so that's something that I'm always thinking about. And what are some of the things you do now to ensure that you remain excellent, you remain right on top of it and not just going through the motions? Because sometimes, you know, somebody gets comfortable in a particular role. It's easy to, you know, perhaps just go through the motions, so yep. to speak. That's a great question. Um, you know, the, the key is to always surround yourself by people that are better than you. Um, because it allows you to be able to strive for better, better things, greater things, um, and also allows you to learn. Um, you know, my philosophy also, you know, when I recruit, um, you know, my team members, et cetera, I always try and surround myself with people that I know are going to be gunning for my job. Um, and, and it pushes me to be better. It pushes me to be able to, to develop them also, um, and, and literally work my way out of a job, um, you know, because it's in working your way out of the job that you set your own ambitions for what's next, you know, what's the next stepping stone, et cetera. So, um, yeah, look, it, it is certainly making sure that, that you have people around you that it's, that are, are going to push you to your limits. Um, that's going to be honest with you. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, we, all of us, we, we like to hear the good things. It's really difficult to hear the, 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 the areas of development and the, the tough things about you. But, but, you know, I've, I've grown up, you know, learning one thing, the, the people that tell you the difficult things to hear are the ones that have got your best interests at heart. So it is about surrounding yourself with those individuals. Never be the smartest one in the room. Always surround yourself with people that are better than you, smarter than you, um, and they'll keep challenging you to do better. 
Yeah, that's certainly true. A sense of competition can keep you right on top of your of your game. You know, we've seen that even with uh, some of the best sporting teams. Uh, they always ensure that you know they keep a, a healthy sense of competition within the team because the complacency can certainly kick in, and you know, uh, mediocre results then follow. But you, you're speaking at length about people who have contributed to you at the time yep. throughout all the, all this uh, that's going on. Um, how, what is the role of, of transparency at the time? Because I'm sure you had to be extremely transparent with those people. Um, how did you have the courage to be transparent with like where you were? And how you're handling with everything, because sometimes, you know, it's easy to try and keep that perfect picture, right? Whilst uh, one does actually need to be open about it. Yeah, look, absolutely. And 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 generally, I'm quite a private person, actually. Um, you know, I'm the person that that will smile um, and and just get on with it, no matter what's going on behind the scenes. But but you know, you get to a point where you need to show vulnerability. Um, you know, you need to actually say, look, you know, I need help or, you know, this is not a good time. Um, so, so certainly be vulnerable. That's, that's the other key factor if, if you really want to be, be successful. Um, also just, you know, be open to, to opportunities. Um, you know, that the one thing I've learned is never say no to an opportunity, sure. even if you don't know how to do it. Obviously, be transparent about the fact, like you say, you know, you talk about transparency. Be transparent about the fact that you don't know how to do it, but be willing to have the right attitude. Be willing to, to say, I don't know how to do it and I need help, but I'm also willing to learn. And, and it often comes at a lot of personal sacrifice. It comes at the expense of family sacrifice in order to learn what you need to learn, invest the time. But once you've got on top of it, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the opportunities are endless. So, so my philosophy in life is when opportunities present themselves, I never say no. I always go, right, that's great. How do I make this happen? Yeah, uh, you certainly are a duo because you get things done and whenever opportunity does come, you certainly take it to get things done. Um, but also getting things done is what you had to do with this business, right? Yep. I mean, you're taking, taking over the business. Not only do you have to take it over the business, you have to make sure it's running properly uh, and also that you're looking at innovative ways to ensure that the business grows and that the business scales. What were you actually doing to ensure that the business scales? Because, I mean, it's a little overwhelming to take over the responsibility, but let alone having to extend it a little bit more, bring some nuances into the business, innovate a little bit, and grow the business. Look, let me, let me, not, um, let me not kid you. It, 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 at first, it was nothing to do with grow. At, at first, it was all about survival. Um, you know, it was, it was about, it was about reputation. It was about the family name. Um, you know, it was about making sure that, you know, all the accounts were paid, all the vendors were settled, um, you know, despite the circumstances. So, so, you know, initially it was all about survival. Um, it was about, you know, how do I get through to the next day? How do I make sure that, you know, the doors remain open and, and how do I make sure that the reputation that had been built, um, continues to sustain in in the future. So so those were the priorities. It it was about um, you know really taking everything that I'd clearly been groomed to do over a very you know long period of time from from a young age, um, and and really start putting those things into practice. Um, you know you must know I'd, I just completed university, first year of articles, literally in my first official job, and now all of a sudden you know you're running you're running a family business and on the same time trying to do articles. So so it was about survival. Yeah. Um and 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 yeah, you know, as as things started to settle down, you know, then you start thinking about, okay, you know, what does the future look like? Um and, and that's where I had to make some personal choices in terms of, you know, how much longer do I want to continue down this road now that, you know, accounts had been settled, the family name was was intact. Um, do I want to continue down this road or um, do I make the step stone to, to official corporate life yeah. um, and go and see, you know, and go and see what I could learn in the corporate space. And, and that was the decision I eventually took um, to, to then go into corporate full time. Yeah, corporate is a space you've been thriving in, actually, because, you know, you're the chief financial officer at Tiger Brands in South Africa, which is a very big uh, organization, well, you take up a lot of responsibility within this organization, but you know, it didn't just happen. You know, you've, you've built over some years, you mentioned a lot of learnings mm -hmm. within the family business. I'm sure there are some lessons that you've carried forward, even that you reflect on even till today. Are there any that come to mind? Yeah, look, you know, it's, uh, it was quite interesting when you start articles, um, you know, they, they normally sit you down and they say to you, 
um, you're going to be engaging with very powerful, influential people on a day-to-day basis, you know, at your clients. Um, and also remember, nine out of ten times, when you complete your articles, you'll probably end up working for one of your clients. So always make sure, you know, you put your best foot forward um, in all the engagements and opportunities that you get. Um, and, and that was something I certainly did. Hey, um, every one of my other clients, um, I always made sure I putting up, I put my best foot forward, not only internally at, at the Deloitte environment, but also with every one of my other clients. And, and, and that was exactly what happened. You know, um, after I finished my articles, I stayed on with Deloitte for a while, um, and then was given an opportunity to go and work for one of my other clients. Uh, which was Samsung Electronics, you know, and, and that was a great opportunity to go and see what the other side of the table looks like. You know, it's one thing when you audit and you find all these issues and you go, here you go, management, these are things you need to fix. When all of a sudden you end up working at one of your clients, you go, geez, you know, all those things I said we must fix now, I've got to do this myself, you yeah. know? So so it is about it is about making sure that that every one of your engagements is is a powerful one um, and you're always putting your best foot forward in those. Um, and, and that's certainly what, what I found, um, you know, from, from my Deloitte days, Samsung days, and, and many of the jobs thereafter. In, in terms of responsibility now, yeah, look, you know, um, as, it's, it's always an ambition, right? Um, what's, the, what's the final state? You know, when you're a charter accountant, um, there's often two ways you want to go. Either you want to become an audit partner or you want to become a CFO. Um, you know, those are generally the, the type of career choices you make. Um, you know, my, my advice would be enjoy the journey. Um, you know, I, I made my first finance director role at 29, um, got there and then I thought, sure, you know, how did this journey happen so quickly? Um, you know, could I have enjoyed it a little bit more? Um, so if I do have one regret, it is that I, I, you know, maybe I should have enjoyed the journey a bit more, but, uh, with responsibility, you know, it's, um, it's, it's great. It's, it's great to feel empowered, uh, within the Tiger Brands environment, um, South African business, you know, the biggest food manufacturing business in, in the country. Um, great opportunities, um, especially in, in, in a South African business where you're empowered to make the decisions. Um, but uh, yeah, look, like I said, don't don't be afraid to ask questions. And, and when you don't know, ask for help. Yeah. Um, you, you, you spoke moments ago about the entrepreneurial spirit that you picked up yep. when you were still working in the family business. Um, how did that help you within the transition to corporate? Because it's a whole different culture, a whole different environment. So I'm interested to hear a bit more about the transition bit because, you know, sometimes it also brings a bit of a lifestyle change with it. So uh, what was that like? Yeah, look, you know, um, I think we we miss a lot of that in corporate. I think, you know, it's a very powerful combination um, if you can bring that entrepreneurial spirit into a corporate environment. Um, you know, you'll often hear a, a lot of corporates talking about um, risk-taking, the need to take risks. Um, and, and what you find, you know, in, in corporate environments is that senior leadership are, are often afraid to take risks. Um, and, and, you know, if you're not, if you're not willing to take risks, it makes it quite difficult to grow an organization. So you need that entrepreneurial spirit, that element of risk taking combined with the corporate side, you know, bringing about that corporate governance to make sure that these are educated risks, um, that set businesses up for success. So it's about, you know, taking a chance, um, you know, looking at an opportunity and going, yep. Look, this may be outside of our norm, but, you know, there's an opportunity here. You know, if I, if I give you an example, Tiger Brands recently launched a venture capital fund. Right. Um, you know, and, and you know, you, you look at our business and, and, you know, we're running into the billions of rands of turnover, but we're engaging with startup businesses that are doing innovative things that we believe is going to be the future of South Africa and future of Africa. Um, you know, they're creating innovative products, they're creating, you know, innovative technology ideas, et cetera. And those are the things we're interested in. But you can only do that if you've got the entrepreneurial mindset and you can see the bigger picture and you can see the future opportunities that present themselves. Um, you know, the other thing is in an entrepreneurial business, you know, you make the decision. Um, you know, there's nobody there that you have to, you know, consult 10 layers up. You, you're the person that takes the decision and you run with it. Um, and, and that's what I'm finding in, in the corporate environment. There's often that expectation that, you know, 
take an educated guess, make a decision and, and go with it. Um, and the final thing, you know, if, if I draw the correlation that benefits me in my corporate role, because I've come from a family owned business, every organization I've worked for is very personal to me. I don't work for the organization, you know, as oh, it's a nine to five, pay me my salary. Yeah. I take the business as my own. Every financial decision that we take, I take it under the guise of this is my money. What's the right business call to make on this? So, so there's that element of very personalized impact, very personalized ownership um, and responsibility. And it's amazing when, when you think about it of, oh, this is somebody else's money, the decisions you'll take versus this is my own money, the decisions you'll take. Yeah. Um, you've made a, a very interesting uh, you know, uh, description there of what's happening. And I like the fact that your entrepreneurial spirit is allowed to come alive within the corporate space, expressing itself through that corporate entrepreneurial uh, you know, mantle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You spoke about uh, the, you know, the capital uh, fund that you putting for startups, which I think is great. Um, but I'm keen now to find out about your journey at the time, because you mentioned that you were also uh, able to score your first directorship position at 29. Uh, but before your current role as CFO at Tiger Brands, you're also a CFO at MassMart, Mondals, Macro, uh, as well as uh, Entice Beverages, as well as at Gibbs as well. So you have had uh, a long in a time of experience, but what allowed you to to like switch companies so quickly uh, over the years was being at an executive level. You know, it would be different if you're going down a position down, but you're continuously sure. keeping it at the same level. The intensity is a lot more. The responsibility is a lot more, as you alluded to before. So what allowed you to keep making the decision to switch? Um, yeah, look, you know, that's a great question. I, um, so, so maybe also just to, to, to just correct the, the career transition. Um, so I've held, I've held a finance director role at, at Macro. Um, I've held some strategic roles um, within the MassMart group, but, but, but the, the FD role was particularly at, at, at Macro. Um, I think, you know, what, the, one, the one example that certainly comes back to my mind, when, when we finished articles at Deloitte, it was in our final year, um, we were allowed the opportunity um, to engage with corporates. Um, and, and funny enough, the then CFO of MassMart and the then CEO of MassMart were actually invited to Deloitte to come and talk to us as, as article clerks coming out of our articles. And the then CFO of MassMart stood in the front and he said, you know, we often hear that, um, you know, you shouldn't be jumping jobs. You should, you know, you should be looking for a long-term career in an organization because it demonstrates loyalty, et cetera, you know, and that, that was the school that, you know, and, and the lessons we were taught at that point in time. And he stood up there and he said, you know what, I'd like to challenge that thinking. If opportunities present themselves and you can adequately explain why you've taken the opportunity, even if it's in a short period of time, take the opportunity. Mm. So for me, that was always something that stood out because, you know, we were coming from, from, from life lessons that said, you know, when you start with a company, you've got to be there for 10, 20 years, you know, um, not for a period of three years or two years and then, you know, taking the next opportunity. So it was that what resonated with me. And, and like I said, you know, earlier on, I've never said no to an opportunity that made sense. And I've never said no to an opportunity that I could justify to myself and to those around me. And if that opportunity meant career growth, learning development, and really challenging me, I've always said yes. To the extent that one of those career moves that you referred to, I actually took a salary cut. Although it was a more senior position, I took a salary cut because I saw the benefit that I could be learning something, being challenged, and I saw the future trajectory that was available. So, you know, the other thing I leave you with is money is not everything. It's important. Right. But, but it's about thinking about the long game, thinking about what's important to you. And, and you know, for me personally, culture is important. Um, and, and also the people I work with is important. And, and most importantly for me, it's about having fun at what I do. And the day that it stops being fun, that's the day it's time to find something else to do. Yeah.
<laughs> find something more fun to do as well uh, whilst you're at it in the process. But listening to you now, I cannot but uh, applaud you for the fact that you seem like a very good decision maker. And I don't think it's been like this all the all the years. I think there's a great level of indecision when I think about myself personally. I think that sometimes I have to make certain decisions. And there's a great level of indecision, a, a great sense of indecisiveness, a great sense of hesitation, so to speak. So how did you, you know, get over that uh, sort of like bumpy road of indecision to, you know, to sort of like a smooth tar road of just making decisions of the of the way you seem to be making decisions? No, it's it's not easy and, and it's not all smooth road. Eh? Let me let me tell you that there's still moments where you go, geez, I actually, I'm not too sure if, if I made the right call. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was studying my MBA at Gibbs and, um, you know, we were in, in the operations module um, and, and, you know, the, the professor was in the front of the room um, challenging some of the thinking and, and particularly, um, you know, challenging some of the accounting thinking. And, and being a charter accountant, you know, obviously I was quite like black and white. No, well, this is definitely the right answer. It was some, it was something to do with manufacturing costing or something. And, and I was quite adamant, like, nope, you know, this is right. This is the way to do it from an accounting point of view. And, and eventually, you know, he made his case where at that point in time, you know, you have your aha moment. That was my aha moment during my MBA where I went, oh my word, geez, you know, what he's just said makes perfect sense. Now that I think back on some of my career, you know, decisions and some of the things or the contracts that I may have signed off, were those the right decisions they've made in the first place? So, so you know, it's about it's about acknowledging you're not always going to get it right, um, but it's about being open to 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 understand that you know if you don't get it right, how do you learn from those experiences? So, um, you know, confidence confidence helps, but be careful be, be careful about crossing that line between confidence and arrogance. Yeah. Um, you know, always remain confident, um, you know, trust your gut because, you know, often you'll find that while the information on the table says one thing, your gut will normally tell you something else. So, so trust your gut, believe in yourself, um, and, and, and take a decision. You know what, if it's the wrong decision, don't be afraid to say, oops, I made a mistake. How do I remediate this? So, so don't be arrogant about saying, no, I'm always right. Yeah. That's interesting because you mentioned Gibbs. Uh, Gibbs has also just earned the globally renowned Triple Crown status with the recipient of the EQUIS accreditation, which is a very big uh, recognition and accreditation uh, for Gibbs in particular. But uh, you've also lectured at Gibbs. You've yep. also been the CFO at Gibbs. And you've been a student as well, sit, sat in the lecture halls as a student. So you've had that whole experience from multiple offices, so to speak. Um, why is it important for you to be involved in uh, in academia, so to speak? Because, you know, you are a practitioner. Uh, you now also having the bit of both worlds. Uh, why is it important for you to still be in touch with the academics? So, you know, the, the reason behind that is somebody took the time to develop me. Somebody took the time to help and mentor my career. Um, and, and I've got a passion for, for developing young talent. I've got a, got a passion for, for teaching. Um, and, and that's the rationale behind, you know, me really staying involved at Gibbs, lecturing at Gibbs. Um, and also what I'm about to say is going to sound completely crazy to you, but, um, you know, when I stand in front of a class lecturing, you know, be it on a PDBA class or, or, uh, you know, PMD class or an MBA class, um, I often learn more from the students than they would learn from me. Mm. So, you know, these courses that, that you run at Gibbs are quite practical. Um, you know, most of the, the learning actually takes place from real practical examples um, that you share with students, but students also then share with you. You know, a lot of these students are working. Um, you know, they discuss things that are, are, are happening under confidence, obviously, um, within their respective organizations, or they've got questions about, hey, you know, you speak about this, I've seen this happen in my organization, what do you think? And it's all through that engagement and networking that I actually take out so much of learning from it, where, you know, I then sit back and I go, wow, you know, how does that, how does that situation play back in the organizations that I'm working in? Or how does that situation play back in my personal life? So it's that mutual opportunity to learn and teach, which is awesome, um, but but also that networking opportunity. I mean, you know, till today I get students phoning me up, hey, you know, can we have a coffee? 
Um, can we chat about some career guidance, et cetera? And, and it's, you know, it's such a privilege for me to be able to give back to, to students and give back to the community um, and the same community that's actually taken the time out to help me achieve what I've achieved. Yeah. You've been able to achieve a lot, and I would probably attribute it to the fact that you know, you've taken this journey of lifelong learning, which is what I'm picking up from you. And a uh, great place that you mentioned uh, this happened is at Gibbs and where it's happening as well. But taking you back to Gibbs, though, yep. uh, my final question around uh, your experience at the University of Pretoria, um, what is that one thing about the University of Pretoria that you will never forget? Sure. Um, there's so many, hey, but... Um I, I suppose it, it was my my CFO stint at, at Gibbs. Um, it allowed me the opportunity not only to to network and make a difference at at the at the Gordon Institute campus in in Ilovo, um, but it certainly allowed me the networking opportunity with the University of Pretoria campus as well. Um, you know, I'd attend um, board meetings at the University of Pretoria. I was given the honor to, you know, to meet to, with the then dean of, of the university, a number of the executive committee of, of the university. Um, and, and just the ability to be able to engage with these individuals was such, uh, such you know, such a privilege um, at the end of the day. So, you know, those are kind of things that, that I'll recall um, for a long time. Um, and also, you know, just making some really good friends. Um, you know, careers are one thing, um, but making those lifelong friends um, is is super important. Yeah, very, very important. Um, it's been so lovely to speak with you. I mean, I wish I had all day to keep chatting with you. There's so much to learn and uh, there's just so much insight that you had, but also some really personal stories that you managed to share and we really appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks, Lenny, and thanks for, for the opportunity. I really look forward to engaging with you guys again in the future. Sure. After that conversation, I'm just fired up. I just want to go out there and do the things, right? But I have to step back and reflect on some of the lessons uh, that I picked up from uh, my conversation with Deepa Sita. This, indeed, failure is an opportunity to learn and it's not the end of the road, right? But also she spoke at length about you have to be surrounding yourself with people who are much better than you. That will help you to stay sharper and to always be improving. Well, thank you for listening and thank you for joining us on this journey with the Lead UP podcast. Remember to download, listen and subscribe to the Lead UP podcast uh, wherever you find your podcast. We also like to hear from you, right? You can certainly rate and review the podcast. Tell us your comments, how you feel. Uh, we'll certainly want to get in touch with you. But the Lead UP podcast is indeed a production of the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Office. I'm Lennox Wasara and I'm proud to be hosting this alongside our team, Alna Schutz and Samantha Castle, who are the producers of the podcast, whilst Lou Kluter Productions provides the amazing sound engineering services that you hear. To meet again, nothing but love and light. Goodbye. <laughs>